wanted to welcome everyone who's here for the moment. Um, we were just about 7.31. And uh, while we are at 7.31, we're going to wait a few minutes because uh, everyone is not always watching the clock. And some people may be confused about the time. But this is uh, Temple Israel's uh, series and one of the special programs we have going this evening with uh, attorneys Irina Shea and Colleen Gatekey, uh, who are going to be talking about estate planning. And they're really going to be talking more about uh, giving you an opportunity to share your questions. Uh, they'll present, then there'll be a Q&A time. You can also use the chat feature if you have a particular question. Um, and then they'll go back to short presentations. And then your questions will direct us to um, more personal or specifics, whether it's uh, wills, estates, uh, uh, health directives, whatever would be uh, a, something of concern or general interest. And again, specific questions uh, on a more personal basis could be uh, either spoken to tonight or to them at their office. And again, in the chat feature, we'll have Irina put um, the address so that people can have it if they wish to pursue it. So I want to welcome everyone that's here tonight and bear with us a couple more minutes and we'll uh, get underway. And uh, it's a really pleasure to have Irina and Colleen with us, attorneys, Irina and Colleen, uh, respectfully. My daughter's an attorney, so I have to keep my, keep my, make this correctly. Uh, not a state attorney, mind you, but uh, yeah. uh, nonetheless, I have to make sure respectful. Very good. Give another minute or two. I'll ask people to mute themselves so they don't have extraneous noise, but you can unmute yourself when it comes time for questions or use the chat feature. Um, so mm -hmm. you're welcome to do that as we become uh, more involved in the presentation or questions that you might have. Uh, and as I said, uh, Feel free where to go off in different directions. Uh, although you saw the flyer with the different uh, directions, so if I just go over those briefly, if I have them here. Um, we talked about um, wills, power of attorney, revocable living trusts, healthcare directives, elder law, asset protection, and Medicaid planning. Uh, those were topics we put out there, but if there's a topic that we haven't, um, we should feel free to bring it up. So, um, 734 close enough to start. So I'm going to turn it over to Irina and Colleen and let you welcome us uh, into your program this evening and uh, start off where you're going. And as more people enter, uh, we'll make it a more broad based program. So welcome, Irina and Colleen. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Um, so we're very, Colleen and I are happy to be here and sort of provide some education and updates on the ever-changing fields of estate planning and elder law. We've been asked to talk about seven subjects and I'm gonna start with a brief overview of the first four, which are wills, power of attorney, revocable trust and healthcare directives to try to highlight what they are and why they're important. And I think after COVID, I think people obviously understand the importance of having plans um, well done before there's an emergency. Um, and then Colleen can, will speak to elder law asset protection and Medicaid planning. So what we'll ask people to do, we want this to be really practical for everybody here. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box while we're on that specific topic. That would be the most useful. If it's really personal to you, then maybe hold that for a private conversation with us after the Zoom. Um, but very often your question is being um, contemplated by others on the call. So if it's useful for the group, we'd be happy to answer it. Um, so I think a lot of people have a basic understanding of what an estate plan is, but it's basically organizing your affairs in a way that your assets are distributed in the way that you wish after your passing and what happens in the event of your incapacity. So at the very most basic level, a will says who gets what and when, when you die. And they're important because you should have control over that. There's a lot of modern families, blended families, predeceased children. There's all sorts of family structures. And you have the ability in the state of New Jersey and in the United States of America to say who gets what. Other countries have forced airship. We get to say who gets what. So exercise that right. Create your will. And um, if you die without a will, 
unfortunately, the courts have default and testacy provisions that decide who gets what. It's rarely what you would want. And also your administrator has to post a very expensive bond, often more expensive than the cost of just doing a will. So doing nothing really is not an option. Um, it's just something that um, unfortunately, um, if people are ill and they didn't get to it, um, but we're speaking to an audience of people who hopefully um, are smart enough with their finances and family to get ahead of any problems. Um, and again, if anyone has questions on wills, please put them in the chat box or um, unmute yourself and ask. Um, and if not, I'll just sort of move on to the next sort of important, um, yes, yeah, somebody has their hand up. Yeah, my mom has a will and she moved. Does she have to change her address on the will? Does she have, need a new will? Is she within the state of New Jersey still? Yes. It's fine. It just means that the county in which she resides and when she passes is the one that will, the probate court that will handle this. Does it matter if she changed counties? She doesn't have to change her will because she changed counties, but if she passes, you'll probate her will in the county in which she resides at her death, not at the time she made the will. Does that make sense? Yes. It's a very good question. If she moved Thank to you. Florida or South Carolina, which we were talking about before the call, the state um, in which she resides, that law would govern. And so we tell people, a lot of people are in motion right now with COVID. They're moving to their vacation homes if you're moving to Florida, you need a Florida estate plan. If you're moving to South Carolina, you need a South Carolina estate plan. The New Jersey estate plan you did five years ago isn't um, going to do it. So um, someone asked in the chat, if you have a will, is it necessary to update it? Yes, I'd say every five to 10 years, get a checkup. Tax laws change, families change, finances change, um, get a checkup. The answer is maybe you have a reason to change it and maybe it's a-okay as it is it's like anything else it needs checkups periodically okay so um let's talk a little about um power of attorney so life and death is black and white when you die there's a will with a set of instructions what's much much trickier is incapacity. So being alive, but having dementia, Alzheimer's, a stroke, something where you can't handle your own finances is much trickier. So for that, you need a power of attorney needing an agent to handle affairs for you. It's typically a spouse, adult child. We always want to name two to three people in a row in case somebody's not available to act. This is the most important document of any estate planning document you could sign. If you do nothing else, do this. Um, because without it, you'll end up with a guardianship and um, maybe Colleen touches on this later. She clerked for the guardianship um, judge in uh, Bergen County, New Jersey, and um, it's a very lengthy, expensive and public process. It's very avoidable. Um, we don't want anyone in a guardianship if we can avoid it. And a power of attorney that is valid and current um, is very easy and very effective and puts power in the hands of people you trust, okay, um, without fighting. So power of attorney is extremely important. Um, any questions on that one while we're on that topic? And we can come back at the end to any of the topics, but I just want to put it out there since we're on topic. Yes, Howard. Sorry, I'm going back to step, but uh, if you move to Florida, do you need a Florida attorney to write your will? Yep. Or somebody that's barred in Florida? Someone who's licensed in Florida, yes. But they yep. could be here in New Jersey, but still licensed in Florida? Yes. Right. Yes. So um, Florida law is quite different. Everybody there, the probate, the probate is very easy in New Jersey, okay? It's very friendly. Um, in Florida, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's lengthy. It's expensive. People in Florida use revocable living trusts, and they fund everything, including their piggy bank, into the trusts, okay, to avoid probate. So it's a whole different animal. 
Um, and that's a nice segue, thank you very much, to, um, to the next topic, which is revocable living trusts. And, and what are they and when are they useful? So, um, you know, a will, as I said in the beginning, says who gets what and when, when I die. It's a piece of paper that's only useful at death. You can't really do anything with it at, until then. A revocable living trust is a lifetime trust where you can add assets while you're alive, yet incapacitated. So if you're over the age of 70, it's something worth considering because the possibility of having a diagnosis that could lead to incapacity becomes increasingly um, possible. And you want your spouse or adult children to manage things tightly for you. Um, having a revocable living trust does not pass through probate. So if you had a rev trust and it was funded with investment accounts and your house or whatever, and COVID hit, it wouldn't matter that the courts were closed. Um, the trustees would be able to um, sell, trade, liquidate, do whatever they had to do because the assets would have already been funded into the trust. So, um, and in states like Florida, Carolinas, California, certain states where probate is difficult, everyone uses these. Um, so in New York, even, I would say we have a fair number of clients in New York and the New York courts are very backlogged. I know we all complain about New Jersey sometimes, um, but our probate courts are really good. So um, when you leave the state of New Jersey, it's worth going to local council in the state that you reside to see if you should upgrade to a revocable trust. So someone asked in the chat, what are the tax implications? So a revocable trust has no tax implications. It's a mirror image of you. It's a grantor trust. It carries your social security number. It's not a tax planning tool. Okay. All it is, is a management tool to manage your assets in the event of incapacity. It doesn't save you any taxes. It's not an irrevocable trust. It's not gifting assets away from you. Um, so it's, it's just a pass-through. Um, New Jersey repealed its estate tax in 2018. So I don't know if you all remember, New Jersey was always criticized as being a state that had a really um, punitive estate tax. Anyone dying with more than $675,000 faced an estate tax. That went away in 2018. Okay, so that's the good news. Okay, for at the state level. Um, we still have a New Jersey inheritance tax that did not go away. So if you leave money to siblings, nieces, nephews, a life partner you're not married to, you get caught into this thing called the New Jersey inheritance tax. And that's not going away. <laughs> so if you, don't, if you don't have children and grandchildren and a spouse to leave your money to, you should be talking to your attorney and accountant about inheritance tax and if anything can be done around that. Okay, that's a uniquely New Jersey problem. Okay. Um, can you explain in the chat, uh, the difference between revocable and irrevocable? So Colleen's going to talk later about some irrevocable trusts. Basically revocable means changeable. It's you're still the owner for tax purposes and for nursing home purposes. Irrevocable, you give up ownership, your hand, you're gifting it over to a trust. It's irrevocable, not changeable. So it's off your balance sheet. It's, it's um, for gift tax purposes or for nursing home purposes. But there's a lot of rules around getting it done right so that it actually um, accomplishes the purpose that you're intending it to. So if you're trying to reduce your estate tax exposure, we have certain kinds of trusts irrevocable that do that. If you're trying to qualify for future Medicaid, that's a different kind of um, irrevocable trust called a Medicaid Asset Preservation Trust. That is something that Colleen's gonna discuss a little later. Um, someone asked, what does the revocable trust achieve? The main thing is it achieves um, keeping the courts out of your business. So it achieves um, no probate. It achieves, if you have a lifetime trust for an adult child, that's gonna hold three, $4 million for that child. It's never subject to court oversight. Um, if you are um, 
facing a diagnosis that might lead to incapacity, a revocable trust is a really nice way where you can bundle all your assets under one umbrella and have your children be the trustees of it. It's very protective of you to keep predators and predators away from you. So there's a lot of benefits to revocable. And in certain states that you might end up living, it's kind of necessary because that's the common practice in those, um, in those states. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to healthcare directives. There was another question that's a little more complex that I'm going to defer until later about invasions of trusts or distributions, okay? Um, every adult over 18 should have health, an advanced healthcare directive, right? So that's healthcare proxy, a living will, it should have HIPAA waivers, okay? So why is that? Because you're you're in an accident or you have an illness and you can't speak for yourself. Now what happens, right? You need to name an agent to make those medical decisions for you. That's your healthcare proxy. And you should have A, then B, then C. You want to make sure somebody can answer their phone and deal with the hospital and give instructions on your behalf. And similarly, a living will says, if there are really no more treatment options left, then what? How long do you want to be on life support? At what point would you say enough is enough? And there is a living will that you can initial your choices. And it generally says if two physicians have determined that you are permanently unconscious or at the end stage of a lengthy illness or terminal illness, that at that point you would not wish to be put on life support merely to extend life, but not restore you to capacity. Um, so these things are very important and it's important to do it before you get sick, ideally, so that it's not such an emotional stressor. Um, and we do those as well for our clients for college bound 18 year olds, because once your child turns 18, they are no longer your legal ward and they are, uh, they need their own, um, documents in this regard for you to be able to help them. So that was sort of um, healthcare in a nutshell. If anybody has questions on that, if they can ask or post them now, otherwise we're gonna move on to Colleen talking about the elder law nursing home side of the equation. Yes, somebody's raised their hand. The, uh, regarding the um, uh, healthcare directives, um, these are available from the state. The state of New Jersey has one. Many hospitals have one. Um, you can get them from lawyers. Is there one that's more useful than another? Are these all, will hospital X accept something you wrote for hospital Y? Uh, how do you deal with that? They're generally accepted as long as they're in substantially valid form and they conform to the New Jersey statute. And that really is the living will language. So I would encourage anyone, if they, the state of New Jersey has a um, free public healthcare directive living will form, it's like 30 pages long with the instructions. It's a bit overwhelming, I'll be honest. So people are welcome to Google that and do a free one or do one with their hospital. Our point, Colleen and I are trying to say, before there's a problem, before there's an emergency, do it when you're clear-minded. Whether you do it on your own or you do it with an attorney, um, do it sort of thoughtfully and intentionally and not in a panic. Um, so I don't know of any hospitals that would not accept a form that substantially complies um, unfortunately, there's no statutory single form. That would be really nice. <laughs> okay. Um, there is something called um, a pulsed um, physician order for life-sustaining treatment. That's usually done in the hospital with a doctor or advanced practice nurse for end-stage cancer patients. It doesn't help you when you're in the car accident or you get COVID. Like we want you to do this proactively. That's our message tonight is don't let things just sort of go by the wayside and then have a real emergency, um, you know, do this ahead of time. So Colleen, do you wanna add anything to that? No, it's, it, I think, you know, just one general point is the point of your estate planning documents in general 
is just to do your best and they're really meant so that you can continue to preserve your personal autonomy and make decisions for yourself and choose the individuals that you want to act on your behalf in the event that you're unable to do so in the case of an, an emergency. So, you know, Irina briefly touched on and I'll talk about it a little bit more um, in a few minutes, but the alternative is if you don't have these documents in place and then the emergency happens and somebody needs to step in to make either healthcare decisions for you, financial decisions for you, get access to your account information, pay your taxes while you're ill, you know, things like that. Their only other option in order to help you is to apply for a guardianship. And that's a court process. It's time consuming. It's especially lengthy now and it's expensive. And it also then takes away your ability to choose who that person is going to be to act on your behalf. And sometimes in some cases, even the state of New Jersey will be appointed to be that person to make decisions for you. So again, you know, estate planning, it really is meant to, you know, be there for the in case of emergency situations, like Irina was saying, you know, so that you are prepared and the people that are in your life and your loved ones are also prepared to know what your plans are and, you know, what your wishes are should um, they have to make decisions for you. Someone asked a related question. If no advanced directive exists, what would happen to a child of ours who is over 18? Right. So um, if the parents are in agreement, it's possible the hospital takes the parents' instructions. If the parents are divorced and in disagreement, they're going to demand a medical guardianship. And that's a disaster. And obviously time is of the essence. So, and also the state in which your child lives may or may not have um, a presumptive um, um, statute on who would be the next in line to make uh, medical decisions for someone. New York actually has a, a, a presumptive list of spouse, domestic partner, followed by adult child, et cetera, et cetera. New Jersey does not. So our suggestion is any child over 18 should do a simple healthcare directive naming mom and dad. Um, that's going to bridge them until they're married someday, which might not be for 15 more years or more, right? So, and when they have their own spouse, they can do their own planning with their spouse. But until then, I think the bridge is really important. Even if they do a quick online version, it's much better than nothing. Okay. Um, and then there was a question about trust protecting from nursing homes. So I'm going to segue all that over to Colleen, <laughs> um, because this now enters the world of elder law asset protection and Medicaid planning. And so I'm going to let her take it from here. Sure. So elder law is really just the practice of law to address issues that are facing the aging population. So within um, the elder law umbrella, there's, you know, estate planning that we do to make sure again, that our clients are able to um, maintain that personal autonomy for as long as possible. Um, and also keep in mind that in order to execute legal documents, you have to have the capacity in order to sign the legal documents. So estate planning is a big part of our practice to make sure that everybody's protected that way, you know, for all the reasons that Irina stated prior. Um, I guess I'll, you know, segue and just talk a little bit more about the guardianships as the alternative. So again, should you not have, let's just say you're an individual and if um, your spouse um, lacks capacity for some reason or has, ha has passed away um, and you have several children, maybe you have three children and maybe not all of your children get along. Um, if you don't have documents in place and if something were to happen to you, then, you know, the hospital and the banks or, you know, everybody's going to try to turn to one person. And if you haven't signed your power of attorney, then no one has the legal authority just because they're your son or daughter, just because they're your husband or wife or your, your partner does not mean that they have the legal authority to sign checks on your behalf, to sign legal documents on your behalf and to make medical decisions for you. Um, so in those cases, then what happens is that somebody, whether it be even a nursing home can file for a guardianship. 
if let's say their bill is accumulating and no one in the family has stepped in to apply for guardianship themselves, then they have the authority to apply for guardianship and try to get the state of New Jersey appointed um, so that somebody has access to your funds in order to you know, pay their bill. Um, but somebody will apply for guardianship. So whether that be a loved one, you know, anybody in your family, um, or again, an institution will apply to the courts to request, it's a, a two prong request. It's one that you be declared legally incapacitated. And two is that an individual or the state of New Jersey be appointed to be your legal guardian. Um, part of the guardianship application process involves the requirement that you also, so the individual filing the application has to include with their complaint two um, medical certifications from two physicians certifying that you are unable to make financial and medical decisions for yourself. So the state of New Jersey does not take guardianships lightly. Guardianships are different than conservatorships. Um, some states I think use the terms interchangeably, but in New Jersey, they're very distinct applications. A conservatorship needs um, consent from the individual whose assets are gonna be under the conservatorship and a guardianship. There's no consent that's needed. Um, this is the court in the state of New Jersey taking away an individual's legal rights. They don't have the right to make any decisions for themselves anymore. Should the court find that that individual does in fact not have the ability to make financial and medical decisions for themselves. And if that burden is met by the individual or institution filing for the guardianship, then the second part is, okay, well, who is the appropriate person to serve in that capacity? And sometimes this is where, as I'm sure you could imagine, it can get ugly um, if you have individuals in your family that don't agree as to who should be the person to make these decisions for you um, or who should have access to your money, then the court, you know, the court's gonna make that decision and they're gonna appoint an individual um, to be your legal guardian. When somebody is appointed a legal guardian, they have complete control over your decision-making capacity. Um, so again, it, it's not to be taken lightly. It is something that the courts um, monitor as well. So they, you know, Irina touched on basically, you know, the difference between a will and a revocable trust is the court staying out of your business. I mean, a guardianship is full on in your business forever and it's never going away. Once you are a ward of the state, there are guardianship monitoring requirements now where the guardian has to report to the court annually um, to provide them with updates what you have in your bank accounts, how they're using the money. I mean, everything gets filed with the court to make sure that the person that they've appointed is handling um, you know, your decisions and your finances appropriately. So the estate part, the estate planning part of our practice is extremely important, important because as you can see, that's really the only way to guarantee that the person that you want to make decisions for yourself is going to be the person who makes decisions for you. Otherwise, an emergency happens. If something, if you have a stroke and you're unable to, you know, communicate those wishes, then you know the guardianship may be the route that your family has to go down. Um, there is always going to be an attorney involved. And by that, I mean that even if you file the guardianship on your own, on behalf of your loved one, by statute, the court requires that a court appointed attorney be appointed on behalf of the alleged incapacitated person. So that attorney is going to be appointed to represent the individual who they're saying lacks capacity. Um, that attorney's job is to advocate for that person should the alleged incapacitated person have a preference or have a position in the matter. A lot of times, unfortunately, and especially the guardianships that I handle, the alleged incapacitated person does not have the capacity, doesn't even really know that the guardianship has been filed. So a lot of times what this court appointed attorney's role is in that circumstance is just to make sure 
that all the proper protocols are in place and that the individual that's being appointed is the appropriate person um, to be appointed as the guardian. So as you can see, guardianships, um, they're very involved, they're expensive, they're time consuming, and they all can be avoided if you get your estate planning documents um, completed. I see a question here. I've been told by lawyers that it's important to make sure that your loved ones know in advance what choices you've made and how, um, how badly a relative can respond to your choices. So I, I think your, your question is turning on, well, do you, because a lot of our clients do ask us, do we tell our, do I tell my son that he's going to be the financial power of attorney? And do I tell my daughter she's going to be my medical proxy? Um, these documents are meant to take action when there is an emergency. I always think it is a good idea to advise the agents that they are, you know, um, you have appointed them in that capacity or ahead of time speak to them and see who would be the most appropriate person or who would feel comfortable serving in that capacity. And as Irina said earlier, um, it's important to name, you know, substitutes as well, because, you know, life goes on. And even if you've named your son as your financial power of attorney, maybe perhaps at that point in his, in his life, if you fall ill, he is unable to, you know, take on that responsibility, then you're going to have a substitute able and willing um, to step in and to take over as well. I mean, I don't know if you have was, anything was, else to add on to that was question. That, was, I guess I'd ask, was that the question, Sharon, that you were asking? It was not a question so much as a caution um, that I've heard from others that uh, they make these decisions without telling uh, their loved ones who's got this responsibility and who does not have this responsibility. And they avoid telling them because they don't wanna hurt anyone's feelings because I did not consider you the appropriate person to do this for me. Yeah. It's, it's a really important point. I'll say that what we counsel clients is pick the person most suited to that job. In, in families, someone is likely to be more medically oriented or has some medical field background. Um, someone's more financial banking oriented. In other words, share the wealth, pick, pick the right person for the right job. These are really intense, overwhelming jobs. It's, it's interesting to hear that when people feel left out, it's really like a big ask. It's a heavy lift, right? So we would prefer that sibling A is handling the power of attorney and sibling B is at the bedside negotiating medical care um, or navigating, I should say, medical care. And that the, then they, they group chat on their text, what's going on with mom, right? That's a more balanced approach. And then we like co-executors for, for the wills typically. So there's full transparency and, and no funny business. Um, but to Colleen's point, we encourage people to have a courtesy conversation because once in a while, the person you're thinking of says, uh, I'd rather not have that particular job. Thank you for thinking of me. No, thank you. <laughs> it's better to know that in advance. There's another question. So this is your state planning, um, state dependent, meaning can you provide estate planning for an elderly Florida couple? Uh, the answer is no. So again, you have to talk to an attorney that is barred in the state where um, the couple resides. So, and the reason being is that every law, I mean, I'm sorry, every state has different laws that govern, right? So you wanna make sure if it's on your estate planning documents that they check off all the boxes and they will be legally enforceable in that state. And then also for, you know, there's tax consequences very drastically from state to state. I mean, even New York and New Jersey, you know, it's night and day and we have, you know, we're right here um, on the border. So it's very important to consult an attorney that is licensed to practice law in the state that you are um, residing or intending to reside. Um, the same thing goes with Medicaid planning. And I'll talk about that you know, um, 
in a few seconds, but it's extremely state, per, state specific. So it's important again, to always consult with a practitioner in the state that um, you're intending to reside in. I'd go one little step further and say, make sure the attorney really practices there. You can have a law license there, but not be in the weeds day in and day out. But when it comes to taxes and Medicaid, you need to know the weeds. It's really, it's really tricky stuff. So um, look to work with someone who's a specialist in the state and the county in which you or your loved one is residing to get an optimal result is my advice. Yep. So um, asset preservation, I'll just you know, move on. We could always circle back to general elder law questions. Um, so asset preservation is exactly that. You're trying to preserve as much as your assets as possible um, before applying for any public benefits. So um, the only benefit that is going to pay for an individual's long-term care is the Medicaid program, okay? So Medicare is an entitlement program. We all pay into it when you turn 65 or if you become disabled, you're entitled to that benefit. You get that health insurance um, and, you know, and that's that. Medicaid is a means tested benefit. So you have to meet certain requirements. And again, in every state, they are extremely different, what someone can keep, what they can't, what's considered an asset, what's not considered an asset. So like Irina just mentioned earlier, you know, you, if you have, you know, a, a problem, you know, with your stomach, you don't go to a cardiologist, right? So it's the same thing with, you know, legal issues. It's important to make sure that you're seeing a practitioner that specializes in Medicaid planning and you don't go to your, you know, real estate attorney that, you know, helped you with the closing on your house because it's just extremely nuanced and each state is different. Um, so asset preservation is planning. It's a planning tool that can be done in the event that you are concerned that you may need long-term care in the future. And you would like to preserve as much of your estate to pass down to future generations as possible rather than spending that down on your care. So again, we have Medicare, which is your health insurance, and then Medicaid is the only program that's gonna pay the nursing home or assisted living facility or pay to have an aide come into your home. Um, otherwise, it's either if you have long-term care insurance, that'll assist with some payments, usually for a certain period of times. But again, it's not, it's very rarely a lifetime thing um, and very rarely covers the entire cost. And then there's just your private pay individual. So that's what we all are. So when you enter a facility, um, you, they have a bill and they're gonna be charging you. I mean, here in Bergen County, even for assisted living now, it's getting close to $12,000 a month in some of these memory care facilities. So nursing, skilled nursing care in Bergen County is gonna run you anywhere from 12 to $18,000 a month per person. Um, assisted living care is gonna run anywhere from six to $12,000 a month. And then having an aid in the home, if you need 24 hour care, it can be just as expensive. I mean, these home health care agencies charge a pretty penny for their hourly fees. Um, and if you need around the clock care it can become extremely expensive. Um, so asset preservation is again, the goal is to see what can I preserve um, for you know, future generations? What can I pass on? And I think it was you, Bob, that ans uh, asked a question earlier. Um, I'm trying to find it. I'm sorry. Right. Do, do irrevocable or irrevocable trusts, right. um, are they assets that uh, cannot yeah. be touched by a nursing home or can they so, be by the nursing home? Yes. Okay. So when we talk about asset preservation, you're talking about transferring assets to an irrevocable trust. Okay. And an irrevocable trust Unlike the revocable trust that Irina was talking about, where again, your social security number is attached to it, it's a mirror image of you, an irrevocable trust is its own entity, okay? So it's like a third party, you can think of it that way. It gets what's called an EIN, which is like its social security number. 
and assets that are transferred into that trust no longer belong to you. Okay, so that is why it, it gets eventually protected from Medicaid. Again, so long as it's drafted properly and in the state where you're planning on applying for Medicaid. Um, so long as it meets the requirements for that state, five years after those assets are transferred into that trust, Medicaid has no right to require that you use those assets towards your care. So a lot of people ask me all the time, well, I don't want the state of New Jersey or the nursing home to take my money. So that's not essentially what happens. What happens is that there's just regulations that say until you meet a certain asset level, and in 2021 for a single or widowed individual, your assets have to be reduced to $2,000 or less before Medicaid. Again, it's a welfare program. It's a means tested benefit. So before the state of New Jersey steps in to pay for your nursing home bill, they say you have to have $2,000. That's our requirement in New Jersey. For a married individual, you're the community spouse. So the non-institutionalized spouse is entitled to keep the marital home, one car, and one half, but not more than $130,000 in change. So again, each state is different what you're able to keep. But in New Jersey, those are the magic numbers. So again, it's not that the state takes everything else from you or the nursing home takes everything else from you. It's just that you have to spend down your money in a way that is consistent with the regulations that will get you on the Medicaid benefit in order for Medicaid um, to kick in and pay on your behalf. So an irrevocable trust takes assets out of your name and places it into this third party entity. So again, the catch with the irrevocable trust is, is that you cannot have any access to those funds. Unlike the revocable trust, you cannot revoke it. You can't decide a year later, I want that money back, okay? Um, secondly, you are not the beneficiary of that trust. So um, to take a distribution from that trust, that's usually in the, the planning that we do is usually a child or children. And then the trustee, you are also not the trustee. So you're not in control of how that trust is invested um, and when distributions get made. So again, generally it's, an, it's a child. Um, so the reason why Medicaid, um, that I'm sorry, the reason why an irrevocable trust protects assets is because it's like this ironclad trust where the money no longer belongs to you. So if you don't, if you know, own the asset anymore, the Medicaid can't require that you use it for your care before they pay for you, okay? In New Jersey, we have what's called a five-year look back period. So when you apply for Medicaid, you apply in the county and in the state in which you reside, and you have to provide the county with five years of statements for all bank accounts, all, you know, literally any account that you have, checking accounts, savings accounts, IRAs, 401ks, um, annuities, any account that you can think of, you have to provide Medicaid with a full 60 month history, transactional history of that account. And what Medicaid is doing is they're looking to see if you gave away money, mm -hmm. okay? Because they wanna make sure that you didn't give away $500,000 and then apply for Medicaid the next day, and now you're asking the state of New Jersey to pay for your nursing home bill. But so long as you gave away $500,000 five years before you apply, they don't have the right to ask for anything beyond the five-year period. So the benefit with asset preservation planning, number one, you need time, right? And um, you need to at least have the desire to transfer those assets, you know, and preserve them for future generations. But you also have to be aware that you're no longer going to be in control of those assets. So yes, irrevocable trusts can protect assets from um, being subject, I'll say, to the Medicaid spend down regulation. So in effect, then they do protect them. 
from being required to be spent down on your care. Um, so again, as you can see, I think asset preservation and Medicaid planning, they are intertwined. So asset preservation, again, we're just trying to preserve as much as we can. The Medicaid planning, um, there can also be crisis Medicaid planning. Um, so again, in New Jersey, unfortunately, New Jersey considers an asset as anything under the sun. Whereas in New York, for instance, if you have a qualified asset such as an IRA that's in payout status to you, um, that's not counted towards your asset limit. Okay, but in New Jersey, they don't care if it's in payout status, if it's not in payout status, if it's your, in your name or your husband's name, um, that counts. And they also don't care if there would be a penalty on liquidating the account. Okay, so in New Jersey, New Jersey's, you know, like Irina said, not too bad with, you know, probate and actually our probate courts are really good. But in New Jersey for Medicaid planning, we're probably one of the worst in the country. Um, the regulations are extremely strict as to what is considered an asset. Like I said, everything is considered an asset, vacant property, property you co-own with other individuals. If you co-own property with somebody else, Medicaid never has a right to attach a lien to the portion of the property that the other individual owns. So let's say you own a, a shore house with child and you each own 50%. Medicaid can't force you to sell that property, but what they can do is they'll put a lien on your 50% interest. Okay. So part of what our job is, what we do is that we try to evaluate what our clients have and we try to see, okay, are there things that we can do in order to, you know, preserve that asset? So in the case of co-owned property, sometimes we will remove your name from the property. So that is solely in the name of your child's name. We could transfer it to a trust, you know, things like that so that we can get that five-year clock running so that in the event that you do need long-term care in the future, you'll more easily qualify for Medicaid to pay for your care. So does anybody have any um, questions with regard to Medicaid or asset preservation planning? I see, okay. What's the difference between a spendthrift trust and a special needs trust for an adult child who can't control spending up assets left to them? Irina, do you wanna touch on this? It's not really a... Yeah, this isn't really, well, so this is a related question of what to do with a special needs adult child and how to leave them an inheritance. And the answer is leaving it in a supplemental needs trust that will not jeopardize their existing benefits because for special needs persons, their Medicaid lifetime benefits are enormously important because of the expensive therapies they'll need. And if a trust is left to them um, in, in the right form, which is a supplemental needs trust, it will preserve those benefits. And if it's left outright to them, it could blow it. So you want to know that mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, all the well-meaning people who might leave the special needs person in their estate plan need to do it in the right way through an SNT. Um, that's an entire topic in and of itself. It could be a whole thing. But just make sure, ideally, the parent of the special needs person has something set up that can become the receptacle for all other inheritances to come in there, okay? Um, really important. So it was a, thank you for the question. It was a good question. And then, um, Irina, there's a follow-up question that he, uh, Joshua direct message and said, what are the inheritance tax implications with respect to trusts? It, inheritance tax applies based on who the recipient is. So if the recipient were a nephew of yours, there would be an inheritance tax paid off the top that ranges up to 16%. That's one six. It's paid by the estate of the um, decedent. So um, from a parent or grandparent, no such issue exists. 
So, um, and life insurance is exempt. So when we have a special needs adult child, very often we recommend using life insurance to um, fund the SNT because it won't be subject to inheritance tax or, or um, it's also a, a, a way to lever up and fund up the SNT so it's big enough to provide for that person's lifetime needs. Um, so I want to take a teeny bit of time to talk about um, the estate tax um, that someone had asked about earlier on the chat and then we'll open to all the rest of the chat questions. Um, you're going to hear in the news a lot of proposals in Congress right now about changes to estate tax, income tax, and capital gains tax. I'll tell you right now, it is, it's all tossed up in the air and where it lands, we don't know. Um, this year, the federal estate tax exemption is $11.7 million per person, so double that for a married couple. It's slated to sunset and come down Jan 1 of 2026 to 5 million index per person, which roughly translates to 6.3 million per person, 12.6 million per couple. Um, there is a proposal, um, the Democratic proposal for a long time has been 3.5 million exempt per person, 7 million per married. Um, so if you're under those thresholds of three and a half single or seven married, I don't want you to lose sleep over this. Um, President Biden actually just, I think two days ago, said that the estate tax changes were not gonna be part of his package. Um, the bottom line is we need immediate revenue raisers to fund COVID relief. And so income tax is the fastest way to raise revenue, not waiting for people to die. So as scary as the triggers are for estate tax, and they're gonna maybe limit the gift tax, um, possibly cap, um, to some lower level. Um, they are trying to maybe do away with stepped up basis at death, which right now is like a super win-win when we have really no estate tax on most people and you get stepped up basis at death, it's a win-win. Do I think that could change? Yes, it could change. And the Van Hollen bill is a little disturbing because it's a retroactive proposal, which means that estate planners are betwixt and between on what telling wealthy clients what they should do because they could get caught in the net. Um, so depending on, <clears throat> on the wealth level of a person, you could try to take some calculated um, risks and make some gifts, um, but you'd have to consider the basis issues, not just the estate tax issues. Um, one thing that is certain that I'll mention that not everyone knows about is that if you now leave your retirement plan designated to your children or your grandchildren, they now have to take it out over only 10 years. And that's because the SECURE Act that went into effect January of 2020 became law really quickly before people had time to debate and understand it. So if you leave your IRA to your spouse, they get a lifetime stretch. You leave it to your child, they have to take it out over 10 years. So if you're leaving a million dollar IRA to one child, that's 100,000 a year over 10 years, they pay income tax on it. And you need to think about, is that an outcome that I want or do I need to do trust planning or something else? That's relatively new and people are just sort of digesting that. Um, but that's raising a lot of money right now for, um, for the federal government because of the um, incredible wealth transfer that will be happening in this coming decade. So um, a lot is in play. And if you're at the higher levels of wealth, you should talk to your attorney and accountant. And if you're hanging under the radar, um, I would just take your foot off the accelerator and just wait and see and watch and first see what happens because it's very hard to, where the rules are shifting, it's very hard to make um, clear decisions. If God forbid your spouse dies in the next year or two, please be sure to do what's called a portability election. Even if there's no estate tax due, file what's called a portability election to make sure you preserve their estate tax exemption for the year in which they die, to port it over to your later death. Um, because most people are going to want their full two coupons, if you will, um, to 
cover for any estate tax excess. This is something that your accountant will understand or your estate attorney will understand. Um, yes, Bob. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, so that's my little estate tax summary. Um, there were some other questions that I think were more for Colleen in the sure. chat box. So I saw, Anne, you asked, um, how do you preserve income for one spouse if the other requires nursing home care? So it's a good question because there's a difference in New Jersey how um, the state treats assets versus income for married individuals when you're applying for Medicaid. So when you're applying for Medicaid, again, as I mentioned earlier, the assets are considered as one marital pot. Okay, so that one half, but not more than $130,000 number um, is derived from all of your marital assets. So whether that be an account in your name alone, in your spouse's name alone, or jointly together, or jointly with a, a child or a third party, if your name or your spouse's name is attached to an account, Medicaid in New Jersey will consider it an available asset, okay? Income is different. Income follows the name on the check rule. So if you are the community spouse or the non-institutionalized spouse, you're entitled to keep all of your income. There is no obligation that any of your income has to go towards the cost of your spouse's care, okay? The Medicaid applicant's income, however, um, essentially, could belong to the, the facility and then the state of New Jersey pays the difference, okay? But when you're married, um, depending on your um, expenses, so Medicaid will factor in you know, your mortgage payment, your basic utilities. Um, they don't consider things like your cell phone bill and your cable and things like that. It's your basic shelter costs. And if your income is not sufficient to meet those basic shelter costs, then they will allow you to um, retain a portion of the institutionalized spouse's income. Sometimes it's the full amount. It really depends on the numbers. It depends on how much everybody is receiving and what your shelter expenses are. So there is a calculation that goes into it when you do apply for Medicaid. And in some circumstances, the community spouse is able to keep a portion sometimes all of the institutionalized spouse's income. And in some cases, the institutional, or I'm sorry, the community spouse doesn't get to keep any of the institutionalized spouse's income. And all of that income has to go to the facility. And then again, the state of New Jersey pays the balance of their bill. So I'd like to ask a follow-up question. Is that when sure. you consider doing some kind of a trust? Not for income, okay? So again, income, is always gonna, you know, your social security, if you are the community spouse, it's always gonna belong to you. Okay, and your is that for pension? Pensions are the same thing. Your pension would belong to you. Um, things that are not considered income, so like a required minimum distribution, so your RMDs, that's considered an asset, right? Because you have the ability to liquidate that asset. So that's not considered income. Really, income is really just going to be your pension um, and uh, then your social security, or if you're working as well. So any you know, salary benefits that you're receiving. So therefore, your IRA is, the, is an asset. Is an asset, correct. Yep, yep. And so then so, the question becomes how you preserve those. Right. So um, yes, and obviously there are tax consequences with liquidating an IRA, right? So um, there are planning tools in New Jersey. It's called the Medicaid compliant annuity. It's a complex planning tool. It only works in the, you know, certain situations. You have to be the right client for it. Um, but essentially what it does is it takes an asset and it converts it into an income stream, right? So let's just say if the circumstance, kind of the hypothetical that we're talking about now, if you have, um, if you're, it, you're the community spouse and you have a $500,000 IRA, you obviously don't want to, you know, get rid of all of that money and just spend it down on your husband's care to get down to that $130,000, right? So what you could do is you can convert that into a Medicaid compliant annuity 
there are going to be tax consequences with it. There's no getting away from that. But what it does do is it allows you to take that, you know, $500,000 less the taxes and convert it to an income stream to you over a period of years so that you're able to recoup the majority of those funds because now it's income to you. Okay. Okay. But you can make that decision. You don't have to make that ahead of time. No. So a Medicaid compliant annuity is, it's a crisis planning tool. You certainly should have a conversation if you, um, you know, just to review how your assets are titled, because at least the attorney will be able to say to you, okay, yeah, you're, you're going to be a candidate for some crisis planning and here's what it's going to look like. Right. Or you can sometimes do a hybrid, right. You can do some proactive planning now and perhaps transfer some assets to a Medicaid asset preservation trust. And then those tax deferred assets, um, you can, you know, leave as is. And then the event that your loved one does fall ill and you do have to apply for Medicaid, then perhaps you can kind of go down that Medicaid compliant annuity road as well. Yeah. Well, I think again, it goes back to your advice to look now in anticipation of what you might need later. It's all about knowing your options, right? And knowing so that it's not a big surprise because again, when people, I think there's a big sticker shock too when they first get that bill because a lot of times people get discharged from the hospital. So if you fall ill and you go into the hospital and then you're discharged and Medicare will pay for your rehab for a certain period of time. But then once your rehab days are up, all of a sudden the nursing home is now charging you $450 per day for you to stay there. So then there's, you know, the evaluation of, okay, well, which assets do we use first? How much do, is there any way we can, you know, protect some of this for myself or for future generations? So it, it at least just gets the conversation started to see, you know, what assets you have and if there's anything to do now. And then if not, you at least have a plan for what it will look like um, in helpful. the event. Thank you. I think it's it's worth mentioning that the ideal Medicaid planning client is typically a healthy 70-year-old who has a five-year runway where we think they're going to be okay for five years. You put something like the house and some um, investments into the trust, and after the five years, it's off the table. These are typically for individuals with a million or less net worth or a married couple with 1.5 million or less then you can really move the needle. You can get the house out of the way and some cash out of the way and still have enough private pay funds to get you through a nice facility stay before going on Medicaid. This is not for the $5 million client. I'm sorry to say, my friends, you are self-private pay people. You were in my world. You are going to talk to me about taxes, not about Medicaid. And um, this is just very fact sensitive. So when people Google or talk to their neighbor, about what they did, you know, for all you know, they had a house, a pension, and a hundred thousand dollar investment account, right? They're an ideal Medicaid client. The other person had a two million dollar IRA and a house, and that's a whole different analysis, right? Completely different analysis for what's the best way to protect from nursing home and taxes for that individual. So the Google sometimes <laughs> is like too much. I Google everything. So I'm guilty of this, but it's not one size fits all. And what works for someone in um, another state is very different than what would work in New Jersey, because what Colleen said is very true. New Jersey is the worst for Medicaid. Just tough. They're tough as nails. And every time there's a new planning technique, the state is on it and they shut it down. And then the elder law bar is in a tizzy about now what, you know, and workarounds. So um, for that, especially, I would encourage people to have a proper planning consultation with someone who knows what they're doing and can give you alternative pathways because your situation is going to be very different than the neighbors and your brother-in-law and whoever else, right? Um, so on that note, what I will be happy to do, and Howard, we're happy to stay longer and answer more, but I'm going to put our contact information in the chat box. So if anyone wants to reach out to the office and 
um, would like a consultation for estate planning or elder law, um, we, we're happy to um, continue the conversation. There's no fee for our estate planning consults. There is a fee for the elder law with um, Colleen. They're tremendously complex, as you may have just gotten a flavor. Um, and they usually involve family meetings with adult children involved on the call to um, sort of map out what these structures might look like. So, um, so I'll type that in the message box and then um, I'll see if people have more questions or Bob, if you'd like us to touch on anything else. Oh, okay. I believe if anyone has any other questions, they certainly should bring them up now. I think there, there are two more that I can you know, quickly answer. Susan, you asked, what are the rules for payouts for an irrevocable trust? Um, so with a Medicaid asset preservation trust is an example for the irrevocable trust that we're talking about in this context. Um, again, the, the usual setup is that you are transferring assets into the trust. If they are liquid assets, right? So you can either transfer real property or you could transfer, say, a brokerage account. If it's a liquid asset, then um, your children are the beneficiaries of that trust. And under no circumstances can the trustee ever make payouts to yourself. So the payouts go to the beneficiary for their health, education, maintenance, and support. Um, so it really, you know, kind of, you know, depends if there's any income tax um, that for instance, um, let's say you invest the assets and there's going to be some income tax consequences on it, then the children you know, can pay the income tax and then take a distribution from the trust to cover the cost of that. Um, so it's something that we always encourage to get your financial advisors involved in part of the call and then also your accountants so that we can you know, get your team essentially on board with how distributions have to be made in your certain circumstances based on what assets are transferred into the trust. Um, and then I saw there was one last question. Does long-term care insurance count as an asset? No. Um, long-term care insurance is never bad to have. What it does is it kind of gives you more planning opportunity time, right? So if you need um, to get through that five-year look back period and you fall ill in year three, let's say, okay, now we still need to get through two years of private pay before Medicaid will start paying for your bill. Well, your long-term care insurance is going to kick in and pay a portion of your daily rate. So it's just less money that you have to draw down on your assets which then buys you time or allows you to transfer more. So if you have long-term care insurance, it's always great. I'm happy to see clients who have it. Um, if you don't have it, it's not the end of the world, but no, it doesn't count as an asset. But what it does is it just offsets the amount of um, money that you have to draw down on your personal assets to cover the cost of your, your fee, which then allows for additional planning. All right. Uh, a ton of information both of you were provided for us and I know that it was deeply meaningful um, because this is something we're confronting and uh, planning ahead is uh, without question um, the key to the best that we can be and I wanted to thank you on behalf of Temple Israel and uh, thank you on behalf of everyone who joined us this evening on behalf of uh, our president, Howard Schreiber, who is right with us, which uh, uh, we appreciate him participating this evening. Um, and we want to thank you, Colleen and Irina, for taking your time at the end of a long day to put in another hour of conversation <laughs> and information. So really terrific. Um, I know more people will be interested and in, we'll certainly be happy to share your names with them as we have learned a great deal. And I hope that we can call on you in the future and other people can call on you individually to help as they plan ahead. Yep. We're delighted to have had you here this evening and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very us. much. It's, it's our pleasure and we love what we do. So we're happy to help families right. anytime. Oh, so glad. Right. If anyone else has any last questions, please uh, share, them, share them now. You could remember Temple Israel in your wills also. Thank you. Very <laughs> <laughs> there you go.
do you do you also practice in New York? Do you provide these services at, for New York residents? Yes, I've been licensed in New York for 25 years. All right. Yep. Well, we'll share that information. Okay. So I want to thank you again and have a good evening the rest of it. Uh, go get something to eat and uh, time to uh, relax because tomorrow we'll be here. So applause uh, on all our parts and thank you for a really informative and educating uh, and educating us about a lot. I know we have many more questions that we can pursue, but thank you again for tonight's efforts. Thank you. Thank have you. a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Night. You're welcome. Goodbye. Thanks, Bob. Welcome, Howard.